Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Crimes, Killers, Cults, and Beer. And you are deafening again. <laughs> I don't know how. All right, hold on. There. <laughs> okay. Uh, just two crazy Florida men drinking beer, talking about true crime, and why the hell not? Why the hell not? Exactly. Why the hell not? It just makes it a little bit crazier that two crazy Florida men are talking about crazy true crime. <laughs> yep. Yes, indeed. <laughs> so, that's Todd. And that is Bill. Yeah, what are you drinking? I am drinking... Something different because I don't know, but I got bush like peach today. Ugh. Yeah, you oh, wouldn't that, like it at all. That sounds horrible. It's actually really good, but I know you wouldn't like it at all. I know I can. I know for a fact you wouldn't like it. <laughs> I'm drinking Bud Light. Yep, but I don't know. I saw it in the saw it in the old uh, Wally World and. It's right. like, yeah, why not? Give it a shot. Well, um, we haven't had an update from the Fort Pierce Loves, the one with the Arby's in a while. Oh, yay. So yesterday I'm going there to do my thing, fill up and all that stuff. And um, and I, I, I mean, this is a really short one. The setup is going to take longer than the actual story. So I'm I'm, <laughs> I'm getting my stuff. I go up to the cashier. Cashier uh, cashier rings me out and everything, and I pay her, and she tells me to have a nice life. Have a nice life? Holy <laughs> shit. I'm like, what? She goes, have a nice life. I'm like, okay. Wow. <laughs> All right. <laughs> now, there's something that, yeah. Usually you say that to somebody when you're like, when you want them to when like. When to, to go fuck off or something. <laughs> or to yeah, die. Yeah, you or, want them to go piss off and die. Yeah, have a nice life, motherfucker. Anyway. I'm like, what did I do to you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? Why? Are, what the? <laughs> yeah. That what was the, what I, yeah, exactly. No shit. <laughs> I mean, I. Oh, I, man. All right. I, I didn't think, you know, I'm just like, okay, I. I wasn't even going to entertain the situation. I was just like, fuck it. <laughs> Thanks. You too. <laughs> <sighs> okay. Wow. Right. Manager, manager, this man just threatened me. He told me to have a nice life. <laughs> Bitch, you just told me to have a nice life. <laughs> you did it first. You did it first. <laughs> <Or> even. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. All right. Well, Sir, I'm yeah, yeah, that's, that's odd. I'm going to need to ask you to leave, sir. Okay, fine. You have a nice life, manager, dude. Yep. <laughs> you have a nice life. I'm out. Yeah. Doses. <laughs> that, was, that was just weird. It, it had been a while since anything noteworthy had happened there. So, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, we, have, we haven't had a love story in quite a while. No. <laughs> so... Which, uh, which is, I guess, not necessarily a bad thing, but it's still. No, it's not. But this, this, one, I could, even though it was really, like, really short, I couldn't let it go. I had to, I had to bring it up. Oh I yeah, it, it was just so totally. odd. But everything that yeah, happens that's... in that loves is odd. <laughs> it's like it's like it's in an alternate dimension or something. Yeah. And at this, okay, this th this one is all over the place. Like I told you, and um, yeah, to the point to where I don't even know what I'm going to call the episode yet. <laughs> oh, it's one of those. <laughs> yes, I mean it's easy. It's easy to follow. Don't, uh, but there's just you know, it's it's just all over the place. So, all right, in Oklahoma City, late night, late one night in April of 1990, three men were driving along a road. They see a bunch of debris on the side of the road, so they stop to investigate. There's clothing, groceries, a cell phone, other random things, and there's a body. And a body. Okay. Um, a young blonde woman, but they find out that she's, they discover that she's still alive. Oh. So, uh, um, source for this episode is primarily the Netflix documentary Girl in the Picture. It's, it's really good. 
I was looking for something to cover right. and I found this story and the caption, I read the caption. It said a woman found dying by the road, leaves a son behind and a man claiming to be her husband and a mystery that unfolds like a nightmare. Oh, so I said that, <laughs> that's ominous. <laughs> yes. That, that's, that's the word I was looking for. That's, that's very ominous sounding. <laughs> so I said, that's it. So not, not knowing anything else about this case. So I was hearing it for the first time as I wrote the notes and holy shit, this story has more layers than an onion. Or an ogre. <laughs> yeah. Cause ogres have layers. Cause ogres have layers as well. Yeah. Right. Like a parfait. <laughs> <laughs> So they call 911. She's taken to the hospital and her husband, a man named Clarence, shows up. He says she's a stripper in Tulsa and that her name is Tanya Hughes. She had started working at that club in 1989, but she was also in college at that point. But she wasn't really a party girl. Clarence then says that they have a young, young son named Michael. This man was much older than the woman and gave off kind of a weird vibe. But Friends of Tanya confirmed that they were indeed married and did have a son. Yeah, and they 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 said that the little the little boy stuck to Tanya and would rarely go anywhere near Clarence. So that's a that's a red flag right there. Definitely, yeah. But but Clarence wouldn't let Tanya and Michael go anywhere alone. He had just basically kept them under lock and key. That's another red flag. Yeah. Doctors examine her and they find um, bruises and injuries on her that looked old. And they also, obviously, they they found some, um, they found some, you know, fresh injuries too. But she died shortly yeah. after arriving at the, the hospital. <clears throat> and when the girls that Tanya worked with found out from Clarence, um, who said that they, that she had been in a hit and run accident, which that's fishy in the middle of the night on a road in Oklahoma city. <laughs> yeah. But, um, they, they wanted to tell her family. So they looked up, they looked up, they looked up in the phone book and they, and they called And When Tanya's mother answered, she was confused and she, she had said that her daughter had died 18 years earlier at 18 months old. So it, it was just the wrong okay. person. It was just the wrong person. Oh, all so, right. Clarence told her coworkers that visitors weren't allowed, but one of the dancers, that, the dancer friends that she had, went there to see her anyway. And a nurse told this friend that she thought it was foul play. <sighs> she had, she, she had, she had wounds that looked more like she had been in a fight rather than hit by a car. So Tanya's coworkers had reported bruises, bruises on her constantly and she always had an excuse for him like she fell or she bumped into something etc yeah and we all know that's not what was going on but anyway right but but clarence had taken out a life insurance policy on her and she she wanted to get away from clarence but she was afraid for her son but after tanya's death michael went with Clarence, you know, something that none of her friends were okay with. And they went to child services with the information about the bruises and her death. And Michael was put into a foster, uh, a foster home. So mm, that, that sucks, but it's, it's actually better it, than the alternative. <laughs> it's actually kind of, um, striking. You know, it, it's also that the, um, uh, that the, Tulsa Child Protective Services would take the word of a, a bunch of strippers to even go to uh, even go. I mean, this is 1990. I don't know. I don't know, but I don't. I I just thought that little tidbit was kind of interesting. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I mean, yeah. I don't know. I don't know what to say there. So the foster parents reported that he was behind developmentally and that he was still on bottles and he had only been drinking Pepsi. 
right. another red flag. Yeah. Well, at least okay. he got a Pepsi. At least he got a Pepsi, unlike my buddy. <laughs> yeah. Mike. Unlike Mike. Because <laughs> that's all he wanted. All he wanted was a Pepsi. Uh, he would also um, throw major temper tantrums, banging his head on the on the floor. You know, definitely signs of abuse. Yeah. And Michael was with them for four years. And after the first two, the foster parents had turned him into pretty much a normal kid. And Clarence had been trying the entire time to get Michael back and even took it to court. And on visits, Michael would hide from Clarence. So finally, child, child services ordered a paternity test and it was revealed that Clarence was not the father. There, you there was, are not the father. <laughs> there, um, there was no biological link at all. He wasn't even blood related at all. So Clarence then began st- stalking the foster family. So, oh, on, se- on se- September 12th, 1994, police got a call that there was a man tied to a tree in the woods. What had happened was that Clarence had gone into the school where Michael was at, pointed a gun at the principal, told him that he was taking Michael and that they took, that they took Michael or Clarence took Michael and the, um, the principal and jacked, um, the principal's truck and they, and they disappeared and they ultimately, um, he ultimately tied the principal to a tree and then disappeared in the principal's truck with Michael. So that's kidnapping. Yeah. Twice, probably. <laughs> yeah. Oh, bringing, bringing, a, bringing a firearm onto a school. Although that yeah. probably wasn't as, as big of a, an offense back then as it is now, but still. Yeah, it's probably it was probably coming around, but anyway. Yeah. Oh, Jesus! So he so he took the principal and the kid and his and the principal's truck. Yeah. Right. And tied tied the principal to a tree and then disappeared with the truck and the kid. Oh. Ambitious little okay. fuck, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Holy shit. Poor kid that wasn't even his. Yeah, no kidding, right? Well, you know. No kidding. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. All right, there it is. It went there. <laughs> that was punny. All right, here we go. Yeah, that was funny. So the FBI was, was contacted. Funny. <laughs> yeah. The FBI was contacted and Joe Fitzpatrick, Agent Joe Fitz, Agent Agent Joe Fitzpatrick. <laughs> a fucking rock star of an agent was put on the case. <clears throat> and APB was put out for Michael and Clarence. And they discovered that in nineteen ninety, Clarence had tried to collect on his wife's life insurance policy. And the social security number that he had given was for a man named Franklin Floyd. So, okay. They also discovered that Clarence or Franklin Floyd or whoever the hell he was had many aliases. Now, Franklin Floyd had been in a halfway house as well. In 1960, he had abducted a little girl. In 1962, he had abducted and raped a four year old little girl. In 1963, he had robbed a bank. He was sent to prison, and um, yeah, for for the bank robbery in um, 1963, he was sent to prison, and he was released into the halfway house in 1972. In 1973, he attacked a woman. He was arrested, but he posted bail, and then he was charged with failure to appear because he failed to appear. That's why you would get get a failure to appear that, charge, in which you fail a, yeah. fail to appear. Yeah. Yes. That, that's usually how that works. I was explaining that to you, yeah. not our listeners. 
Okay. Shots fired. All right. Oh boy. He's he's gonna get yeah. me back, guys. He's gonna get me back. I know he is. <laughs> yes. I can just tell just You're by the never way you went. See it coming. I can just tell by the way you went. All right. Yep. Okay. Yep. <laughs> that, that means buckle up, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all right. Yep. All right. Keep going. <laughs> I, 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 I should, I, I should have like a piece of paper and a pencil out so I can take notes to keep track of this because I'm already getting confused, but it's all right. <laughs> but no, it, it, it'll, it'll pan out. Trust me. It'll, it'll even out. Cause, all right. Um, so since, since then he had been a fugitive. 1973 was the last time anybody had ever seen him and he was considered armed and dangerous. Agent Fitzpatrick had figured that they had about a week to find Michael. And the, the news started doing stories about the kidnapping and some of, um, some childhood friends recognized the picture of Tanya. They said that she was not Tanya. Her name was Sharon Marshall, Sh- Sh- Sharon Marshall. So they, they contacted the FBI with this in- information, but put a knife in that. <laughs> okay. So Sharon. <clears throat> Had lived in Georgia when, when, uh, you know, as, as a kid, uh, you know, through school and everything. And in high school, she, you know, she was in ROTC, the science club. She was in the gifted program and she had a lot going on for her. And she had been accepted into Georgia Tech on a full scholarship and was going to study to be an aerospace engineer. This girl is a freaking winner. Yeah. <laughs> but Sharon's dad was sketchy. And. Uh-oh. He would ask the parents of Sharon's friends for loans. And um they're like, no. <laughs> and, <laughs> and in the senior yearbook, he took out a full page ad congratulating her for getting into Georgia Tech. Now most parents who did that used baby pictures, but her dad used a glamour shot type picture. And her friends thought oh. that was a little weird. Yeah. Yeah, that is a little odd. Now, according to Sharon's friends, her mother was killed in a car accident when she was in second grade, and he had and she, and she had been raised by her dad, but put a knife in that too. Is this, I'm gonna run out of knives on this one too, aren't I? <laughs> yeah, you be, you better order another set of knives and hope Amazon can do that little drone delivery, you know, thing and just deliver it right, <laughs> right. to you because you're gonna need them on yeah. this episode. You're... <laughs> All right. Well. So, because that's two right there. Yeah. So, um, her her dad was really strict with her, and she had to do all the cooking, and he kept her off the phone when she was home. So he's basically just sheltering her, isolating her, and yeah. And she would talk on the phone with her friends, but as soon as he got home, she'd get nervous and like, "I gotta go by." <laughs> So around this time, Sharon got pregnant and was panicking to her friends, but she decided to have the baby and put it up for adoption. But as punishment, her dad wouldn't let her go to college. So I'm guessing she wasn't 18 yet at that point. Oh, because if she was 18, she could have just wanted to fuck off. Yeah. Um. She said to, she said, somebody has to take care of daddy and she hung up. <laughs> okay. Well, it's common for girls to refer, you know, like Southern Pete, Southern Bells to refer to their, their parents as daddy. My daddy. Oh, I know. That's, uh, that's not really where, anyway, that's not the point. Right. But yeah, I got you. So, um, she and her, Dad went to Arizona for her to have the baby and put it up there and put it up for adoption there. Why Arizona? I don't know, but whatever. Yeah. Uh, They just threw a dart at the map and said, I guess we're going here. Pretty much. uh, Apparently. Now back to Michael's kidnapping. Yeah. The, the story had been aired on America's Most Wanted, and they had gotten multiple tips about Michael. 
Now, when Sharon's friends had gone to the FBI letting them know who Sharon really was, they had pictures. And guess who was also in the pictures? Oh, her Kate? dad? Yes. Well, yeah, but who the is dad. her dad? Oh, um, Clarence. A.K.A. Franklin Floyd. A.K.A. AKA Franklin Floyd, yeah. A.K.A. Warren Marshall, Sharon's father. Yeah. That's weird turn number one. <laughs> All right. So in 19, 1989, before Sharon had been killed, they had changed their name to Clarence and Tanya Hughes in, while they were in Arizona. They were married there. They were, um, they were married. They were, th- ah. they were later married under those new names in Louisiana, but put a knife in that. Okay. So the big mystery was what happened from the time they left Georgia to the time that Sharon was killed. How does this woman with everything going for her um, become married to her dad and a stripper in Oklahoma and, and becoming a stripper, a, a stripper, a stripper in, <laughs> in Oklahoma? <laughs> yeah, that's, um, that's a little <sighs> odd. They're in Tulsa. You know what you get when you um, spell Tulsa backward? A slut. Yep. (laughs) Um, (laughs) At this point, her death was still considered a hit and run. Although Franklin was suspicious, there was no proof that he had killed her. And there wasn't even any circumstantial evidence to tie him to it either. All right. So at one point in 1988, they ended up in Tampa where she became employed as a stripper at Mons Venus, the main strip club in Tampa. And it's still there on Dale, Ma- Dale Mabry Avenue near the Tampa Bay Buccaneers Stadium and about at least 30 other strip clubs. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Did you ever wonder why they have so many Super Bowls in Tampa? It's because of all the all the strip clubs right down the street from the stadium. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's, uh... <laughs> yeah. But, so, so many strip clubs centrally located to the stadium. Yeah, it's like who needs Sodom and Gomorrah when you've got Dale Mabry Avenue in in Tampa, <laughs> <laughs> right? Oh, I love Tampa. I like Tampa. I don't love it. But, um, anyway. but she got in trouble for her. Oh God, this is sick. She got in trouble on her very first night working there for offering sex services for $50. And she said that her dad had told her to do it and that he had bought her condoms. Okay. She yeah, wasn't. Uh, that's, um, she, yeah, that's fucked up. Yeah. She wasn't fired, but she got in trouble but she was allowed to keep working there as long as she didn't do that again. Yeah. And, um, but soon she began showing pregnant and she had Michael in Tampa. All right. Now, while in Tampa, so, so apparently they didn't put the baby up for adoption in Arizona. Give me a second. Okay. <sighs> I'm not using a condenser mic, obviously, but still, she was singing very loudly. <laughs> you know, I, I couldn't hear. Her, so, and, well, it was anyway. it, it was get it was it, it it wouldn't have gotten picked up by the 58, but it was it was distracting me, and, and I had headphones on. <laughs> Copy that. So, so while in Ch- Champa, Sharon had made a friend at the Mons, at Mons, Mons Venus. That you know, this this girl was drop dead gorgeous. She made lots of money at the club, enough to like pay cash for a Corvette. Um, but she she would come hang out with the Marshals at their shitty trailer, and 
and um, she had her, her name was her name was Cheryl, and she she had um, high aspirations to be a model. And one night there was a baby. There was a babysitter that was that spent a lot of time there too, and they they were there hanging out and everything, and they were about to watch wrestling, and wrestling, wrestling, and Warren <laughs> pull, pulled out a VHS tape to record it. He hit play to see what was on it, and there was a video of Sharon and Cheryl topless <laughs> dancing on the beach, and guess who was filming? Oh God, Clarence. Yep. See, these are too easy to guess because that's who it has to be. Anyway. Oh, I know. Because we haven't talked about anybody else. <laughs> I know. It, it wasn't Agent Fitz, Fitzpatrick. <laughs> <laughs> you want to, that would have been a, that would have been, that would have been a twist. <laughs> that would have been a that twist. That would have been a twist. So yeah, that would have been like, all right, I'm done with this. My brain can't handle this anymore. <laughs> yeah. No shit. <laughs> so, um, Clarence. Warren, Franklin, whoever the hell he is, he flipped out telling the babysitter it was nothing and not to say anything to anybody. <laughs> but the story was that Warren was filming Cheryl to send it to Playboy so she could become a star. It doesn't work no. like that. No, <laughs> not really. No. You know, the do you have any idea how many fucking VHS tapes probably got mailed to Playboy on a weekly basis? <laughs> and they probably just got tossed away, too. Yep. You know, back, it's like sending unsolicited music to a record company back in the day. They just they go, yeah. oh, we didn't ask for this. In the trash it goes. Mm -hmm. The circular file. Yep. Anyway. So he was also trying to have sex with Cheryl, but she didn't want to. And he was trying to, one night he was trying to force himself on her and, and he became violent with her. And then Sharon and, um, Clarence bounced after that or Warren, Clarence, whatever. Whoever. <laughs> and this is when they went to, um, to Tulsa. Okay. A little, a little more context, context on Warren's treatment of Sharon. One night when they were still, when they were still in Georgia, her dad let one of her friends come over to have a sleepover and they were in, in, um, her room. They were changing clothes. They were getting out of their regular clothes and into nightgowns or whatever. But, um, the friend saw lots of sexy lingerie and this, she's under 18 at this point, like probably like 16, 15, 16 or something. And Sharon said that. Her dad had bought all of it for her. Oh. <laughs> but oh boy. At that moment, Warren came in with a gun screaming at them, What are you doing? And waving the you know, pointing the gun at him, waving it around and everything. And they were just standing there in their underwear at that point. Yeah. Um and then he started laughing maniacally and Sharon was laughing too, saying, Oh daddy's just being silly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what happens yeah, next this is, is not, not silly the fact it's, any, it, right. it's, in, it's anything but silly like silly and what happens next would be <laughs> like um, silly would be right here with us and um what happened next would be the Andromeda, the Andromeda Galaxy. I'm sorry, that's the best <laughs> I could come up with. I didn't have it. I didn't have it written down. Uh, okay. No. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, okay, I got you. Yeah, I got you. So, he left the room, but then he came back um, shortly later, and he still shortly had the gun, <laughs> and he still had the gun. And he ordered the friend to cover her head with a pillow and lie down and cover her head with the pillow. She did. And then he raped Sharon point, while pointing a gun to her head with the friend oh. in the, in the same bed right next, right next to him. Wow. I wish that the, um, that other, Damn. Dimension, I'm... Yeah. 
the, the fucking balls on this guy, man. I mean, and he's the one. He's that girl's actual father, though, right? We'll get there. <laughs> okay, but the next time they saw each other, Sharon hugged her and hugged her friend and said, "It's okay, Daddy's just like that." Told her to let it go. I'm okay. You're okay. We're every, everything's okay. And the friend no, never. It is. No, it's not okay. <laughs> And okay. the, the, the friend never told anybody because she was scared. And, you know, I, I was thinking, it's like, with all this going on, I wonder how the hell Sharon was able to be so successful in school. You know? Yeah. Because usually um, victims of child abuse like that are not successful in school. And and she's she's killing it. Yeah. Maybe it's what she's, maybe it's like what she's got for her, uh, her exit strategy. I don't know. She didn't have an ex- exit strategy. Well, you know, you know what I mean. Maybe she's like, well, if I do good in school, I'll be able to get away. And Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. It could be. But still, usually, you know, victims like that don't, they, they don't have, they have a, they have a, a victim mind, a victim type mindset. They can't really think about it. And it's not, you know, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe she was different. I don't know. I, don't oh, know. We'll, I guess we'll find whatever, out. <laughs> whatever the case, I mean, she, you know, she she was she was loved by everybody that knew her. I mean, she was a really good person and everything. And it's a shame that she was with this fucking um, cunt piece of yeah. shit, fucking asshole. <sighs> <laughs> yeah. Who exactly? Yeah. So, Agent Fitzpatrick, Doug. Agent Fitz, damn it! Agent Fitzpatrick continued to dig into Floyd, and he found a bombshell. Uh, they discovered a, a a picture of Floyd and Sharon, an Olin Mills type um, type picture. And okay. Sharon was around five or six years old at the time, and it was not a typical picture of or it. It wasn't the typical picture of a father and daughter it was a typical picture of an abused kid she wasn't smiling she had a blank stare and was just kind of looking off into space oh <clears throat> now buckle up no oh, shit all right sharon was t- <laughs> <laughs> click <laughs> yeah sharon was 20 when she died in 1990 so she was born around 1970 so okay. take a guess. Take a guess at what they found. Uh, this one's not as easy as the other ones, but once if you don't get it, and I tell you, you're going to be like, "Oh yeah," because I've already, I've already, you know, I've already set it up. Okay. Um, now it was that she was born around 1970. That she was like one of the kids from the one of his rapes that he did back then. Nope. Nope. Then I don't know. Floyd was in prison from 1963 to 1972. Oh. There's no way that he was Sharon's father. So he's not her father. Okay. Nope. Well, then I guess that would explain why there was no biological between him and the kid. Right. That makes okay. I wish you hadn't, I wish you hadn't asked that question. A few minutes ago, because because when I got to that point, when I got to that point, I was just like, "Dude, <laughs> you know." Yeah. I mean, there's well, some. I, mean, I, I, was only re- I was asking that because that's how we set it up, and I'm like, "But okay, he really wasn't." Yeah. All right, that's fine. Right, but I was, yeah. You know, I I even well, put, it's not fine, but yeah. I even put some real time reaction to this in in my notes. <laughs> I did, <laughs> like because <laughs> like this is the first time I've actually. You know, just like really just use the documentary like this as the main source of you know information and everything. Mm-hmm. And I did some, I did some little, you know, a little bit of Googling here and there for a little, little more clarification, but the main source is this documentary. Okay. But, um, so 
But he had kept her for over 15 years. Now they, they had no idea how old she actually was, but they, but still they, they figured, you know, it's like, okay, you know, she was 20 when she died in 1990. So 1970 douchebag was in prison. Yeah. Um, yeah. so the, the clock was ticking on Michael. Floyd was an accomplished fugitive. So finding him wasn't going to be easy at all. Um, Agent Fitzpatrick, fucking rock star, um, alerted all of the states where he had been to, you know, been known to have, um, have aliases, driver's license numbers, license plate, any, anything they had. He contacted all the states with the information and they got a hit. Yeah. Um, Floyd had just filed to renew a license in Louisville, Kentucky under the name Warren Marshall, complete with an address. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, and this, I don't know. That's, I guess it's a Kentucky thing. I have no idea. Um, did I say Louisville, Kentucky? Uh, that's, yeah, I, I think I, I but yeah. okay. I thought I, I thought I said, I thought I said Louisville, but for some reason, Louisville. I'm pretty sure you said Louisville. Okay. Yeah, if I called if I called it Louisville, then I would lose all credibility as a truck driver. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> Louisville. <laughs> Louisville, yeah. Because that's a place. <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure there is a city somewhere in the United States called Louisville. Yeah, there probably is. Anyway. No, it might be Not a Kentucky, Kentucky though. <laughs> no. The, the, but the, the thing is, is the license had to be shipped to him for some reason. Well, I guess because he filed for it before he got to Louisville. Okay. You know, I don't, I don't know, but for whatever reason, yeah. the, the address had to be shipped to him and agent, Fit, Fit, agent Fitzpatrick flew up to Louisville and he had an agent dress up as a UPS driver to go deliver the, the, the license to the house. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> the package, you know, uh, as, as, as soon as, as soon as, um, he signed for it, um, the FBI agent swarmed him, you know, from where they were, they, they were, they had the place surrounded. They swarmed him as soon as he had signed for the, um, for the package. And mm -hmm. he was arrested without incidents. Now, he had kept to himself at this place, and he was just kind of there, no jobs, no friends. But they found bus tickets to multiple lo locations that he had been to recently with only one person. He, was, he hadn't been traveling with Michael. Oh, okay. So Floyd claimed that Michael was still alive and that he had left him with a rich person. <laughs> him with a rich person with a rich person no rich person is right. gonna, gonna do anything for freaking Floyd yeah Franklin Franklin Floyd whatever the fuck his name is Franklin Floyd Warren Marshall these are these these two alias you know these these names are um are are two like double last name names. Yeah. Warren Warren Marshall, Franklin Floyd. <laughs> yeah, but I mean Franklin and Warren are also first names, but I, but I, get, what, last, I get what you're they're, saying there. Their their last names more often than their first names. But uh, okay. <laughs> so <laughs> Fuck. He also said uh, he also changed up his story. He said that Michael had been stranded in a foreign country. No, dude, he didn't leave him with that Saudi prince that keeps emailing everybody, right? No, but that's not where I went with that one. That's a good one, but that's not where I went with it. I was thinking, it's just like, okay, is he fucking Sergio Andrade? Yeah. <laughs> Remember how they, they no, left that yeah. they left that kid in Spain or whatever. <laughs> yeah. 
I don't know. For some reason, that just came to my mind. But anyway. Well, we both got good ones on that one. Well, because you said, well, the first thing he said, he left him with a rich person. And, that, and right. then he said he was in a foreign country. I'm, oh, he left him with the Saudi prince that's always emailing. <laughs> uh, yeah. Anyway, not the point. But that was just, it was just stupid lie after stupid lie. And he said, I love my son with all my heart and soul. Another lie. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Agent Fitzpatrick figured at this point that Michael was dead. And the, the foster family had been devastated since the day that he was abducted from the school. They loved him with all their heart and soul. <laughs> Right. You know, and they're, they're interviewed several times in the documentary and it's just, they, they adored that kid. Well, in fact, they were, uh, I mean, we're, we're going to, we're going to get, we're going to get there, but I'll just go ahead and say it now since we're talking about it. They, they were, they had, had gone through the process to actually adopt Michael as their own, but yeah, we'll, we'll oh. get it. So, All right. So charging Floyd with Michael's murder was weak because they didn't have a body. And he was charged with two counts of kidnapping and carjacking. And, you know, because he had made the principal drive his own car. And uh, that, that, that was a. He actually this, made him drive the car. Yeah. <laughs> and. Holy crap. All right. This put a, this carried a five year minimum mandatory sentence. Also firearms charges because he was a felon and using the firearm during a kidnapping that's 25 years minimum mandatory mm. so they so they had time to get evidence on everything else so long as they <laughs> are successful with with this trial yeah now they didn't want to put him on the witness stand because that would draw things out but they did I mean, he had an attorney, but they did let him represent himself and question witnesses. <laughs> and, okay. and, and they did let him talk to the judge because this guy was a talker. He just, you know, he loved to, you know, he, he loved to hear himself talk and everything. All these fucking yeah. fucks do. One of those guys. Yeah. And, um, and he would just ramble incoherent bullshit and he'd go on tangents and everything. And now oh, I love this part. The woman <laughs> who was in the room when Floyd had raped Sharon. Uh-huh. You know, she's, she's grown up at this, you know, at this point, but she was there and she testified against him. She was more than happy to do it because it was closure for her because she had been carrying the guilt of not saying anything about it for years, not to mention probably PTSD more than likely. Oh, yeah. Well, good for her. Mm -hmm. Now, Floyd, while she's on the stand, Floyd questions her. You drew your opinion based on on what the FBI told you, right? (laughs) He actually asked her that. He just, you see where this is going next, don't you? Oh, yeah. And he, he just opened the door. He's just like, He set himself up for what's coming next. She said, "Sounds like it." She said, "No, I drew my opinion about you when I saw that lingerie that you bought for Sharon, and when you raped her right next to me. You were a daddy. You were a father. You were supposed to protect her." And his attorney literally just threw the, his papers up in the air at that point. He just. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit. Oh, boy. All right. Talk, talk about a mic drop moment. <laughs> yeah, right? Oh, man. Yeah. I mean, like, that just, you, that, just no. that just sunk it. That just sunk it. It was a freaking, you know, yep. <laughs> it, was, it was a jury trial. Even though it's circumstantial evidence, it was a jury trial. And, um, right. And that was it. That's all the jury needed to hear. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that would do it. <laughs> Fuck. That, that 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 girl was awesome. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. The only thing would have made the only thing it, it would have made it better was if she had called him a sick fuck. Yeah. 
but you know, just for emphasis. <laughs> Absolutely. But the, the evidence is all circumstantial, circumstantial. So, so it was a tough case to prove, but he was still found guilty and he was sentenced to 50 years prison in prison with no parole. My favorite moment of this was when he was being let out of the courtroom in cuffs and reporters tried to interview him. He yells, Fuck you and fuck Oklahoma, son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. What did he, one, he really said that? It's on video, man. It's in the documentary. <laughs> wow. All right. That's crazy. But I, I mean, all right. One reporter says, where's the boy? He says, fuck you, motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Wow. That, that 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 that's so great. I'm glad they put that in the documentary. <laughs> oh yeah, that's awesome. Uh. Now, keep in mind this is all within weeks of the kidnapping. <laughs> um, maybe this FBI team can go to Dallas and show them a few things. <laughs> Yeah. So they found the the school principal's truck. Floyd had actually, for some reason, he, he had taped photos underneath the truck, like a whole bunch of photos. And uh, okay, it was, what like like saving them for later, kind of a thing, or what? <sighs> I think I think that he might have been trying to pin it on the principal, but I mean uh, it it, do, it doesn't make sense because there were there were porn type pictures of Sharon when she was little. So how would the principal oh have no. gotten that? How would the principal have gotten that? Yeah, exactly. So, but so I don't know why he did it. I mean, that was the first thought that popped in my head. But then again, this guy's not smart. <laughs> I'm not a smart man. How how did how did this principal get picture of get get salacious pictures of your daughter when she was a child? Considering you were in Georgia at the time. <sighs> yeah. Uh, uh, anyway, but there were there were almost a hundred photos in total, and in some of the pictures, there was a young woman who was nude and had been beaten severely, and you know she was alive at this point in in the pictures. But the but Agent Fitzpatrick determined, you know, he, he's like, yeah, she's alive, but there's there's no way she survived this, judging by the state of distress that she was, you know, that her body was in in the pictures. So who was this? Yeah. You know, so she had um, distinct tan lines. So they sent pictures to coastal places like Tampa, St. Pete. Mm -hmm. St. Petersburg had an unsolved case where a skeleton had been found. Had two bullet holes in the head. Agent Fitz, Fitzpatrick sent, um, had sent photos of a, a young woman, you know, a, the, that they had, you know, who had been severely beaten, presumably to death, and the shirt seen in in some of the photos of of her, like during her ordeal, matched the shirt mm -hmm. that that had been found with the skeleton in Saint Petersburg. Oh, I told you this guy was a fucking rock star. <laughs> yeah. Damn. Now this the skeleton was known as Jane Doe I-275 because she was found off of I-275 in St. Pete. Yep. So um, through dental records, they identified her. It was Cheryl. She had disappeared um, six years prior, and I'm a little curious to why they waited so long to test the dental records. But... I don't know. Maybe, uh, but um, they, they had, they, they had recently found, you know, they had recently, it didn't say when the skeleton had been found. So maybe they had just recently found it and just hadn't done it yet. 
I don't know. Could be. Yeah, but but still, I'm not. <clears throat> I'm not. Yeah, I'm. I'm I, I, I'm. I, I I was gonna have Dick Darwin try to explain this, but I just decided no. It just it it could have just been that they just hadn't gotten to it yet. Yeah, and that's yeah, yeah. So Dick Darwin, I have to wait for another episode. <laughs> oh, he's been want he's been he's been wanting to to come on again since um, the Katrina Mowry episode. <laughs> He liked being on our show. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he did. <laughs> I wrote a pretty good theme song for him too, but anyway. <laughs> yeah, he did. <laughs> but yeah, that's plus, neither here nor there. Plus I'm not gonna um yeah, I'm I'm not gonna do I'm not gonna say anything bad about the Saint Petersburg Police Department because they're actually a good Police department, <laughs> yeah. and like I, and like I said, the, they found bones, but they didn't say when they had found them, and she had disappeared. Yeah, it was just bones and what was left of the the clothing that was there. It was, it was good enough to identify that it was the same shirt that was in this picture. But so after the end, after the videotape incident on the beach that I told you about mm -hmm. um cheryl had showed up at mons venus with bruises and a black eye and it was re this was revealed by a club manager that floyd was obsessed with cheryl he would constantly call the club asking if she was working as well as asking for personal information like her last name where her dad lived and other personal info information once oh, once again warren franklin what clarence whatever the fuck your what? name is I think we're just going. I think we're just going to, going to call him douchebag for the rest of the episode. How, how about that? <laughs> Works for me. Just yeah. All right. Once again, douchebag. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, just fuck. I don't even. Dude, I don't even know what to say to that. I know. I I just They're like so like so what what I mean it, it doesn't matter what year it is what what in what in your brain makes you think that the owner of the club is going to give away personal information Ugh. right I mean is your brain just that far gone I mean, obviously it is but I mean I that you just think that that's something that happens like on a daily basis like hey. I really like this girl. Can I have her last name? Can I have her real name and her last and her last name and where her parents live? And get, like, give me all this information. I'm give me all this information. Guy. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm good for it. <clears throat> yeah, that'll happen. You know, when I was um, you know, before I moved into this place, I was looking for a place. Obviously, you know that. Um, but yeah. um, <clears throat> this this one woman that I found on Facebook, she you know she. It's like I've got a house on such and such address in um, Lakeland, and um, I'm like, okay, so she has me fill out this application, and all that stuff. I, I looked at at it, and I'm like, okay, I'm interested in seeing the place. So um, she's like, well, okay, cool. Your application's come back. She's just the, like the next day, she's letting time go by. Next day, she's like, um, okay, your application came back fine. You're approved. Um, just go ahead and pay the seventy the the, the seven hundred dollars security deposit, and then I'll meet you there. I'm like, uh, excuse me? Oh, uh, no. That's not how it works. I am not paying you $700 on a sight unseen house. Fuck that. Yeah. And she's, she's just no, like, no, hell no. It's like, you can trust me. I'm a good Christian woman. I would never do that to anybody. I'm like, I'm in a freaking hotel room with my 13 year old <laughs> daughter. Right. Like, so no, people gonna... actually think like that. Ugh. Well, apparently people fall for it because it, they keep doing it. Yeah, no, you know, I'm just like, I'm just like, I'm like, you, you know what? You're, you're, you're a real piece of shit. You know that? And I blocked her. <laughs> right. So when, when he called the, you know, the, the manager basically told it, it's like, okay, if, if this guy calls, put me on the phone. And, um, you know, so he, <clears throat> she would get on the phone. Hi, uh, or Cheryl, uh, and she would just hang up on him. <laughs> so, 
So one night at closing time, the manager came out and saw Cheryl standing next to Floyd's car, and they were arguing, and he was screaming at her. And the manager heard him say that he was going to kill her. The manager intervened, and he revved the and but he revved the engine like he had it in gear. So it was obviously a manual because you rev the engine and the car will lurch or whatever. Uh-huh. So he uh, yeah. kind of had it, had it in gear with his foot on the brake, um, with his foot on the clutch and on the brake, um, but. Yeah, you know, she she based, she walked Cheryl away, and that was the last time anybody had seen Cheryl. Oh, damn! Now, you might have heard about this next part because I think I did. I think I did, and I um, I I, I think I remember hearing something about this. Okay. The next this 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 was when they had bounced. You know, um, the next night, the the babysitter that I mentioned, she saw a man in a truck pull up to Floyd's trailer. He walked behind it and was out of sight for a few minutes. And then he came back out, got back in his truck and drove off. Minutes later, the trailer exploded. You remember hearing something? Oh, shit. You, do you like vaguely remember hearing about that? Because I, I, it rings a bell. I'm not positive if, if I remember that or not, but I think I remember hearing something about that. You know, I, it it's not rigging, it's not doing me anything. But this is eighty eight. This is eighty eight. Didn't Jesus right. Christ, it, dude! It just it just rings it just rings a bell. It, I think I might have heard about that. <laughs> that was so long ago, dude. I don't remember anything like that. Especially, dude. You know, eighty eight, dude. I was, I was, whatever I was, but. I wasn't paying attention to any news back in 88. I'll tell you that right now. I was 15. (laughs) Yeah, I was, yeah. When I was 18, the only thing I cared about was getting drunk and playing guitar and other things and other things and watching (laughs) the news was not one of them. So the chances of me hearing about that are very slim. I don't know if I did or not. It just, it just, when it came across, I was like, it just kind of like, that kind of maybe sounds familiar. Right. I don't know. Floyd and Sharon had bounced from Florida so quickly because he had killed Cheryl and had likely done it in the trailer. So he had somebody blow it up for him. And the, okay. The babysitter later confirmed that, the murder took place in the trailer because she had seen the, you know, when they showed her the photo, she was like, yeah, mm-hmm. I, that that's, that was inside um, <laughs> Floyd's trailer. Yep. That's the place. The reasoning for Sharon and Floyd getting married was because Floyd knew that the police would not be looking for, or they'd be looking for a, a, a man, daughter and a child, not a man, wife and child. Yes. So, um, Floyd was charged with first degree murder for Cheryl in St. Petersburg. And this is Florida where they are going to go after the death penalty. Florida. Yes, we will. Where serial killers go to die. Or at least live on death row until they die. But yeah. All right. Bundy. Anyway. Yeah. Danny Rowling. No, we, 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 we have killed a few of them, but yeah. Uh, I wonder which state has killed more serial killers than any other. I'd, I'd be willing to bet it's Florida since California doesn't really, doesn't do it anymore. It's either Florida Man, or, te- it's know. either Florida or Texas. It's either Florida or Texas. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh but serial killers, if you want to go to Texas and get away with it, go to Dallas. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. And the dream and the dream of going to Vinny's just gets further and further out of reach. <laughs> oh God. So Floyd was extradited to Florida, tried for first degree murder. He was analyzed by a psychiatrist and deemed unfit to stand trial. <laughs> okay. Of course he was, because why not? 
But it didn't matter. You know why? He protested it saying he's fine. <laughs> he's like, no, I'm good. I'll stand trial. You fucking idiot. What? <laughs> yeah. Wait, what? No, I'm fine. What, what an absolute dipshit. <laughs> So, um, the trial went on and he was, um, found guilty and sentenced to death. You say you're fine? Great. Let's do it. That's how we roll in Florida. Yeah, that's how we roll. <laughs> Maybe he was thinking it's like, like if I say, okay, the psych, the psychiatrist says that I'm unfit to stand trial and I say, no, I am. Maybe that'll prove further, uh, that <coughs> I'm unfit. I mean, that might work in California. That it's not. Yeah. That, that, that yeah. might work in California, a little bit of reverse psychology, but that, that shit ain't going to fly in Florida. Nope. <laughs> we give zero fucks. Like, oh, you say, you say you're okay. All right. Here we go. It. Let's go. Yeah. Let's roll. <laughs> Damn right. But Michael was still missing and there are only two cases that agent Fitzpatrick was unable to solve his, his career when, when he was, um, when he retired and that was locating Michael and identifying Sharon and it ate at him. No, I would imagine. Yeah. Um, yeah, because obviously Sharon, as we found out before, Sharon's not Sharon. Yes. So, um, 2002 enter, enter a new player in this case, true crime author slash investigative journalist, Matt Birkbeck, his books, A Beautiful Child, A True Story of Hope, Horror, and an Enduring, and an, and an enduring Human Spirit. What's up with these true crime books and their like, paragraph-long titles, man? <laughs> I don't know, dude. Uh, um, and then the follow-up to that, Ironically enough, called just called Finding Sharon. That's it. That's the title. It's Finding Sharon. Really? <laughs> no, <laughs> take, take no, no extra, no extra, no extra long fucking tagline on there. Anyway, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no, but I've heard of I've heard of Matt Burke back. I mean, I'm, um, yeah. I'm, I might actually, yeah, I, don't, I might actually look in look into him. Maybe try and get him on the show or something but we got to get ryan green on the front on the show first <laughs> yeah yeah we have to do that ryan has we, to be first we haven't done one of his stories in a while and i got a bunch we of like, i got a bunch of his books i i've got i've got like six books that, that you know just sitting in there in my bookshelf right there that i haven't you know covered yet but well you know at least we got material yeah i've got i Car, um, among them are Carl Panzerim and Catherine Knight. Yeah, there you go. But these two books were the inspiration for the Netflix documentary. Like basically all the information that's on the Netflix documentary came from the books. So, okay. and then they, they did interviews and stuff and everything based on the information that was in the books. So, um, so I guess you could say that my source material is those two books. <laughs> In a roundabout kind of way, but yeah. 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 So a Indirectly, of, but yeah. A, a friend of Birkbeck sent him a photo of a little girl that he had found on a missing person website that was called the Doe Network. It was uh, of a little girl in the lap of a man that was assumed to be her father. And she had been kidnapped and raised as his daughter, um, married, and then killed. Oh, man. This, this was the same picture I mentioned earlier. Oh. Um, yeah. And, you know, it, and he, yeah, the, the one where the girl looks unhappy with a blank stare and everything. And Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Birkbeck decides to look into it. So he contacted Joe Fitzpatrick and he wanted to know who Sharon Marshall was and what had happened to Michael. And after talking to Joe Fitzpatrick, um, Birkbeck was all in. And there, there was only one person who 
knew her real identity, and that was, of course, who? Franklin Floyd. Yes. So Birkbeck decided to try and interview Floyd. So he went to the serial killer graveyard that is Stark, Florida, <laughs> which was where <laughs> which was where he was. Um oh, yeah. and you know, where this is where Floyd was on death row. And he was brought into the interview room in chains along with all of his files, and it's a stack like a, a stack of folders that's like over a foot tall. <laughs> Damn. All right. This is a little weird, but it's no no big deal because because he was chained up. But the guards left Birkbeck alone with Floyd. Oh. Well, yeah, I guess I can see that. I mean, I'm sure it's on camera, but you know. Right. I mean, none of none of that footage showed up in the documentary. I guess Stark wasn't well, going to release not. that. Yeah. <laughs> No, they, they're, they're not going to let any of that shit out. No. So Floyd started talking and he wouldn't stop. Floyd was actually under the impression that Burke Beck was there to help him. And I'm so glad that he thought that. <laughs> <laughs> right. So he actually said, as you go, you're going to learn a lot about me. I don't know what you're right. And I don't go to, I don't, and I don't care. I'll help you tell the truth. <laughs> <laughs> You're the freaking Alrighty, then. crime author. Damn. Yeah, dude. Like, what do you <laughs> think is about to happen here? But also, you know, this is coming from the same guy who thought the club owner would give up personal information on one of his yeah one of dancers. The dancers. So, but so you know, maybe he really did think that. I mean, well, he obviously really did think that. But you know what I mean. You know, this was this was back in this was back in the nineties and everything when you know, when it wasn't uncommon for, you know, like strip clubs and everything to have, you know, to to actually be encouraging, you know, the dancers to have sex for extra money and stuff like that. You know, and, and hearing how proactive this um this 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 club this club manager or whatever was and everything, they they ran a really tight ship. They it which well, Back in that the eighties and the nineties and everything, that was kind of unheard of. Well, not really unheard of, but it was, you know. But, well, you but know, then it, the whatever the guy that runs this that owns this club, he's got so much money on the line that he's like, dude, I'm not doing. I don't want anything in here that can bring the cops here for yeah what, any it, reason. But, and it was, I don't know if it still is, but it, at the time, it was the premier. Um, adult. Yeah, dude. I mean, no, dude. Yeah. Mons Venus, dude. There's, there's. I think there's one in Orlando too. I don't know, but the one in, um, the one in Tampa is still there. No, maybe. Well, no, I'm thinking of something else. Never mind. There might not I, be one in Orlando, but I. Anyway, the point is though that people that have those big clubs like that, the ones that are like, this is where you, know, you go, like Rachel's or the Dollhouse you know I mean? or, yeah. Dude, they don't let they don't let no weird shit go on because dude, that's their. I mean, they're making millions from that. Why right. would you? You wouldn't want to piss that away for nothing, right? Or at so, least you know, that's how I feel about it. But. Well, it makes sense, but so F Floyd went to the beginning. I was born in this house in 1943. My mom would drop me off at a church because she couldn't handle raising me. It was the sob story. The the, yeah. the nuns the nuns mistreated me. I was raped by other boys. Blah 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 blah. I really don't give a shit, Frankie. Yeah. And in, in fact, <sighs> that doesn't I wish, matter. I wish they had killed you, Frankie. Actually, I wish they had sent you to the Florida School for Boys in Mariana, Florida, where dozens of bodies have been found in graves all over the premises. I wish they had yeah. sent you there. You know about that place? No, I don't, but I've it's driven by it. It's creepy as shit. It's, it, it, it's closed and fenced off and everything, but everything's still there, and it's creepy as shit, knowing the story. Oh, I bet. It. I mean, yeah. that, oh, that's, I bet. That, that's a future episode for us, easily. Seriously, just uh, everything that went on there. Right. <sighs> well, maybe, maybe we could go up there and do it on the side of the road next to it. Ugh, I, I don't know about that, but we'll see. 
Yeah, it's up in the panhandle, like west of Tallahassee. <sighs> west of Tallahassee? Mm-hmm. So it isn't that like Louisiana? No. You see, it, it's in between Tallahassee and Pensacola. Oh, uh, okay. <sighs> it's about a six hour. I, I, I did. I, I, where I, I am. <laughs> I just, I, I just thought, I thought Tallahassee was about as far west you get in Florida. No. In fact, when Pensacola. Dude, you, ge- this- geography was never a thing for me, so. <laughs> No, Pensacola, and, and I think there's a city or there's a couple cities west of Pensacola before you get to Alabama. Oh, yeah, but, yeah. But do you go to, do you go into Alabama first before you go into Louisiana on ten? Yeah, yeah. You're in Alabama for about thirty minutes, and and their little you know lower panhandle there. See, that's what I'm telling you, dude. Um, geography was never my thing. <laughs> It's like, dude, that, that's the only thing that fucking. Actually, you go through Mississippi. Get. Uh, you go through the lower, you go through the lower panhandle of Mississippi too before you get to Louisiana. Really? All right. Yeah. But yeah, dude, like when, when I took my IQ test, when I, the geography, like, like they make you, like they show you a state and you got to pick out, like, okay, they show you a state in the middle of a blank map of the United States. You have to go, what is that state? And I'm like, I have no fucking idea. I'd probably get every question on that part, right? Yeah, you would, but that that was the only <laughs> thing that lowered my score. Mm. But but I, I still ended up three points below genius, so there's that. Well, I'm I'm gonna have to take the SAT before too long because I'm considering getting a like an IT degree because I'm tired of driving trucks and I want to make the money that I make driving trucks. <laughs> yeah, so. Um, dude, dude, they have all those commercials about cybersecurity. If I can jump on that shit, put a knife in that till after the episode. <laughs> all right, I'm serious. It, it's gonna blow your mind. It's a sign. It's a sign. I got you. <sighs> anyway, so, let's get um, this shit done, dude. Because I got yeah. Okay. All right, all right. All right. All right. All right. All right. Um, point of the matter is why in the fuck would you emerge from all of that if it actually did happen to you and, and do what you did to these children as an adult? If this a, abuse yeah. did happen, guess what? You're 10 times worse than the people who did this to you, Frankie. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I, I didn't know about this case when I started it. But the more I got into it, I started seeing red. And let's let's just say that somebody in my inner circle has had a run-in with a sick fuck like this, you know, at, as <laughs> yeah. a, as as a kid. And yeah, I, I I wish anybody that would do this would would drop dead. And you know, and as at as I was writing the notes and everything, I, I at this point in the notes, I do, I don't know whether or not um. Floyd was alive or dead. I mean, I obviously finished the notes, so I know. But, you know, it's like, I actually wrote, but I hope you're still alive because Stark is only two hours away from me. You like to talk? Talk to me, motherfucker. <laughs> right. I'd, I'd go up there and talk to him. If they, if, if, if they let an author go up there and talk to him, they'd let a podcaster. You know? You'd think. Yeah, you'd think. Which gives me hope about something else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's that too but. so Burke Beck would ask about Sharon and Michael and he wouldn't talk about them he asked where he had gotten Sharon from he claimed he claimed I didn't get her from anywhere she just came with me <laughs> oh Jesus that's still kidnapping you fucking idiot yeah she just came with me. What? Dude, I don't even know. I don't even know what I, to say to that. Well, well, she she got in my she got into my truck of my own free will. I mean, you know, I I might have mentioned pu- puppies or candy or something, but <laughs> but but she came with me willingly. Yeah, it was all her. It was all her choice. Yeah, of course it was. Of course it was. Bigger six six year old. You know they they know what they're doing. 
<sighs> I hate this guy. Yeah, I'm not even going to go there with what's going. Never mind. So, um, but but he denied everything. He denied killing Michael. He even denied killing Cheryl, despite the photographs of her being beaten to a pulp in a shitty trailer. <laughs> Well, but, me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but Burke Beck didn't get what he wanted from Floyd. The The book was finished as an unsolved case describing what he had gone through in the interviews with Floyd. And also, despite, it also talks about despite the, how the hell that Sharon had been living in, how, how she had gone, you know, to be a star student in school, getting the scholarship and everything else, like I was talking about earlier. You know, yeah. When I put that in the notes, I didn't realize that a freaking author was going to come out and say the exact same thing that I did. <laughs> right. Yeah, well, but, you know. I mean, she was she was a, she was a total badass. And after the book came out, the internet sleuths started diving into the case. There was a buzz about who Sharon Marshall really was, and it was it was worldwide as well. I mean, thousands of emails were sent to Burke Beck, and he would read and answer every single one of them, um, and. Some were possible leads. Other were people frustrated saying that they had just wasted their time reading a book that turns out to be an unsolved case. <laughs> <laughs> and I, can, I, I get that frustration. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, especially if that's not something that he's done, you know, I mean. Right. You know, well, yeah. Yeah. We, I, I can see that. We've only done one unsolved case. <laughs> I know. But no, and hopefully we'll help solve it. Huh? I said hopefully because we covered it, it'll add more attention to it and help get it solved. Yeah. But, I mean, I know we're not fucking huge yeah. like that, but yeah, and we're not. And we're, not we're not the only podcast that has covered it either. In 2005, they got a break. An anonymous email came in, and it just simply asked. Would the DNA of Sharon's daughter help you? Oh. What? <laughs> daughter? What the fuck? Oh. <laughs> wow. All right. Um, yeah, when did that happen? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just God. Going into this case, that this was the wrong case to go into blind. <laughs> because I was just like, you know, I, I was like, what? <laughs> you know, what the? Oh boy. Yeah. When did that happen? It's a, it, this is a good case. So, um, up until All this right. point, up so, until the, what? No, no, I was okay. going. Up, up until this point, I figured that the baby that she was pregnant with was Michael. Like, that she got knocked up with in Georgia. I figured that was Michael. Uh -huh. And that, and that she had just had the baby rather than putting it up for adoption. Right. So now I have even more questions. Who is Michael's father? Yeah, it, it's documented in the case that Michael was born in Tampa. Uh huh. So y'all are getting my thoughts on this in real time as I wrote the notes. Uh, you don't usually do, uh, do that, but then again, I usually don't cover cases blind either. Yeah, I'm the <laughs> one that I'm the one that goes in all this shit blind, not him. <laughs> yeah, I think this is the. I think honestly, I think this is the first one that I've ever just started blind, you know, without knowing anything about it, just based on what the caption yeah. said on the freaking documentary. Yeah, <laughs> but, all right. So a young lady named Megan came forward. She was a junior in high school when she, um, when her aunt had found Birkbeck's book. She had told Megan's mom about it, and things started adding up, and Megan's mom told her that there was more to the story about her about her birth mother, and the story was that her birth mother had been killed in a car accident. Which is the actual story on, you know, Sharon. Yeah. Or 
Tanya or whatever. She was killed in a car accident. That's the official version. Mm-hmm. But so they they basically sat down and they gave her, you know, they they had her read the book and then they um they told her what they knew. So she was Sharon's daughter. <laughs> wow. Yeah, this this when is this the happen? one. This this is the one that um they went to um <coughs> this this is the one where they were supposedly going to Arizona to um to put up for adoption. P- putting it up for adoption didn't happen in um or the, the the birth and putting it up for adoption didn't happen in Arizona though. Um a couple had visited an attorney in Louisiana and the the woman was pregnant and the story was they couldn't find yeah you know, they couldn't afford another child. Um and they asked if they could find somebody willing to adopt. And it was Clarence and Tanya. And Clarence Clarence was just rushing through the process and everything. He just wanted to get it over with and get paid. And he didn't even let Tanya speak. <laughs> Yeah. So six weeks later, Megan was born, and the attorney went to um, see Tanya in the hospital room after the baby had been taken. She asked if Tanya wanted to see the baby, and she said that and Tanya said that she couldn't handle that. The attorney, knowing what she knows now, wishes that Sharon had just said, "I need help. Help me." You know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The two the two of them were alone at that point, but she didn't do it. But Floyd came in. Sharon had about a five minute window of opportunity, and once Floyd came back in, it was gone. Yeah, after after Megan, um, after that, Megan took her DNA. You know, she sent her DNA to a, a ancestry site, and it turned out that Sharon had been pregnant three times. Oh. Once in high right. school, once in, once in high school, then the baby that was, uh, you know, that the, this was the baby that was adopted, then Michael and now Megan. Okay. So I had it wrong before that, that baby, that, that first baby was adopted, then Michael and then now Megan. So Megan is the youngest of her three kids. Okay. And, and. So the the first son actually did get it adopted out as as they said when she, when she was in high school. Okay. I'd... Is that when they went to Arizona? Yeah, that's when they went to Arizona. Okay. All right. So now with this DNA, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children got involved. They had a, a small file on on Sharon Marshall, not much to go on. And the person tasked with this case was a woman named Ashley Rodriguez. She called Joe Fitzpatrick, who told her that there was no open case in the within the FBI on Sharon Marshall. It was the only mention was tied to Michael's case. But Joe agreed to help. You know, he was happy to get back into the case because it was unfinished business for him. Mm-hmm. You know, so Ashley decided they needed another shot at Floyd. So. She called the FBI, who sent Scott Lobb and another agent to conduct the interrogation. They wanted to know th- three things. One, who was Sharon Marshall? Two, where's Michael? Three, did he kill Sharon? Yeah. Okay. And, of course, Floyd didn't give them anything. <laughs> but well, of course not. Wait, well, when did he get so smart? <laughs> But um, Scott and the other agent had had gone into this posing as defense attorneys who were looking into his case. <laughs> <laughs> so he just ran Brilliant. it. For like 20, yeah, he just he just ran it for like forty five <laughs> minutes straight. And Scott finally said that he wasn't an attorney; he's an FBI agent. And Floyd's just like, "What the hell, you guys want?" And, um, <laughs> Scott Lobb said that the FBI was reopening the Michael Hughes case. And Floyd said, <coughs> Floyd said, well, I would appreciate it if you'd close it. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you would, you piece oh, of sure shit. I'm sure you would. <laughs> yeah, no shit, right? Fucking douche canoe. I'm sure you'd want it to be closed. Yeah. 
Oh, we're supposed to be calling him douchebag throughout the episode. Yeah, I forgot about that. Or yeah, some something like that, but it doesn't matter. So they came at him saying that Michael Michael was the new Sharon. Michael was supposed to replace Sharon. They began taking that angle brutally and, and Floyd started crying like the little bitch that he is. <laughs> but they but they were crocodile tears though. Of course. And um you know why they're called crocodile tears? Um this is true. This isn't a joke. Crocodile. Oh no, I know. Uh, hey, when, a, when a crocodile, you eats, know what I actually. I... Yeah, go ahead. When a crocodile eats, tears actually come out of its eyes. You know, so making people think that, you know, they're that it's actually. I'm sorry, I have to do this to you or whatever. But it, but he's not because he's just eating, and so therefore, hence the term <coughs> crocodile tears. Alligators don't do that. <laughs> okay. so, the more you know <laughs> see i yeah the more you know see I, I it seems like i remember hearing what they were but i don't remember it being like that but if that's it then that's it that's fine yeah if they're munching on something water will actually secrete out of their eyes no no hence the term crocodile tears okay but, hashtag but I digress. <laughs> yeah. So at that anyway. at that at that point, Scott smacked the table. He's and he asked point blank, "How'd you kill him?" Um, Floyd Floyd looked back and said, "Don't you do that." And at this point, at this point, I'm thinking the grand finale was going to be uh, like a "You can't handle the truth" type of meltdown. <laughs> right. And I was right. <laughs> oh hell yeah! Because Scott banged his fist on the table again. And says, "How did you kill him?" And the Floyd, I guess he had had enough because he dropped the crocodile tears and he said, "I shot him twice in the back of the head to make it quick." <laughs> oh man! I hate this guy. Yeah, this guy is definitely a fucking douche canoe. Mm-hmm. So the foster family. Anyway, the, the, the foster family that Michael was with was devastated because they had been, you know, like I alluded to earlier, they had been trying to adopt Michael, and the process was nearly complete when he had disappeared. Well, what at that, you know, up until that point, it was nearly complete. Everything. I'm sure by that time it was complete. Just like if we find him, he's yours. You know, yeah, but they had other kids who considered Michael a brother. Um, Floyd said that he had buried Michael on the Oklahoma Texas border off of I 35, but they weren't able to locate his remains. But Scott still wanted uh, to know, huh? I don't know. I was just like, all oh. yeah, but um, I mean, if any, any anything's possible, I mean, anything could have happened to it. You know. Oh yeah. Lots of coyotes in that area. <laughs> I'm just saying. Yeah, and chupacabras. <laughs> but <laughs> but um, but Scott Scott Lobb still wanted to know who Sharon Marshall was, so he went back at Floyd, who crum who then crumbled. He said that, that he had met a woman named Sandy who had just lost her her three kids to the state. Now. The information in the documentary says three kids. Um, Katrina Marshall says it was four kids. So I talked to her about this case. She said it was four kids. Okay. So, All right. And she showed me, a, and she showed me a, an article that also said that it was four kids. So it was conflicting information. Okay. Well, that happens, you know, shit. Yeah. Anyway. So I'm just throwing that in there. So, okay. Whether it was three kids or whether it was four kids, the story is still the same. Mm -hmm. So, absolutely. Yep. Um, Scott Lobb asked, um, Scott Lobb asked, what the hell? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> 
I said that she had just lost the three kids to the state, right? Yes. Okay. So Scott Lobb, he then asked, was like, so what was your name at that point? <laughs> <laughs> Another fucking rock star, man. I love this guy. <laughs> Fuck yeah, dude. Hell yeah. Oh, man. All right. I can have a beer with this guy. <laughs> <laughs> what if we get him on the show? <laughs> but, um, I don't know. But Floyd said that he was going by the name Brandon Cleo at that time. <laughs> I don't know why I find that so funny. Brandon Cleo? <laughs> and what year was this? Was that when uh, Miss Cleo was all big on the fucking psychic yeah, hotline uh, thing? No, this was back in the the mid mid 70s. Oh, uh, yeah. They see that the the time is the years are jumping all over the freaking place. Oh, so I know. But but this, this this is when he acquired um, Sharon. Oh, uh, okay. All right, I got so, you. Brandon Cleo, though. Brandon a, Cleo. So that's he, a hell of an alias. Yeah. <laughs> that's the alias that says, "Hey, this is an alias." <laughs> yeah. so, hey, this this is not a real name. Brandon Cleo. <laughs> anyway, moving on. So, um, Cleo. He, so he married this woman, Sandy. And, you know, he, he knew where the girls had been, you know, wh- where they were, as well as all their, their names. So apparently he had done some research on Sandy. So, um... Scott asked him which was the oldest, which kid was the oldest, and apparently Sharon was the oldest, and she had been born in Michigan. And Floyd said that um, that he had seen the birth certificate. So Scott asked her name, and Floyd said that her name, that Sharon's name, that, that Tanya's name was actually Suzanne Savakis. Scott then went back to Matt Birkbeck who, and, and Joe Fitzpatrick and told them the name. And Joe almost cried because he was so happy. And Birkbeck's reaction was like, holy shit! <laughs> and <laughs> Ashley Rodriguez's re- reaction was relief. You know, she was just like, well, we finally know who she is. So the birth mm-hmm. certificate came back, and the parents were Sanda, Sandra Brandenburg and Clifford Savakis. Both, and both parents were still alive. So they, they went oh, to... All right. Yeah, so they went to Sandra and showed her the pictures, and she immediately recognized it as Suzanne. And she asked if it's like, "Well, do you know where she is?" And they had they then had to tell her the bad news. Um, oh. Sand, Sandra was eighteen when she got pregnant with Suzanne. So, um, Sandra and Cliff were high school sweethearts, and they were married after high school. And then Cliff had gone to Vietnam when. You know, and he was in Vietnam when Suzanne was born. Mm-hmm. He got he got a week's leave, and um, it and that was when he got to see Suzanne for the first time, and she was six months old. But when Cliff got back, Sandra was with another guy, and she divorced Cliff. Which oh. <laughs> that happens that happens with young military couples. I mean, it, it does it suck? Yeah, but but it happens. Unfortunately. Yeah. 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 Anyway. So Sandra and this new man ultimately had two children, Allison and Amy, and I'm guessing a baby. Like, right. <laughs> like we were saying, you know, four kids, three kids. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. The, the infant yeah. didn't have a name in the article that I was shown. But um, that didn't last either. All right. And they divorced as well. So Sandra and the girls, it was all girls. Um, Sandra and the girls moved into a trailer, which was knocked down by a tornado. And after that, Sandra had PTSD. And um, she went to social services to get help, but all they did was take the children and send her on away. Social services called Cliff, saying that they wanted to adopt all of the girls together to one family to keep the girls together. He would have first dibs on them. 
But at that point, he was unemployed, living with his parents, and recovering from Vietnam PTSD. Mm-hmm. Um, Sandra actually met Floyd in, the, in in a church, and she was crying. And he came in and sat next to her and talking. He he knew what he he knew what he was doing. God sent me here to to help you. And blah 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 blah. Fuck off. <laughs> he said in that initial first meeting that. Um, that they would go get the kids and get married and he would take care of all of them. And they apparently did get the kids back. Okay. Once they were together, he started becoming a monster and he carried a knife on him all the time. And he would reach for it and ask Sandra, do you think you're ever going to leave me? That's not happening. It's just, I don't get this fucking mindset with these fucking douche canoes that fucking, <laughs> it's just like, it's, <sighs> I don't. I don't know. I. I don't know. I. I'm glad that my brain de- can't comprehend that. You know. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like. Exactly. Like. Why do you? Why? Why do you want? Why would you want to just be with somebody who's fucking afraid? Afraid of you, and that's the only reason that they're with you is because they're afraid of you. It. it, it my. That does not compute yeah. in my in that, my brain. Yeah. Exactly. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's just, I don't know. I, I guess people just, they have that fucking just, they need to control and whatever. I don't know, but uh, yeah, I don't get it. And thank God I don't get it. Yeah, I know. I'm glad. I don't, I'm glad I don't get it. Yeah. But at one time Sandra needed diapers and she was broke and she had written a bad check to a seven 11 and you can see where this is going. Uh, um, yeah. She had apparently done it before because I'm, I'm guessing that um, the douchebag what didn't have a job. So yeah, probably not. So she was sent to jail for 30 days, and okay. you see where this is going. So um, uh, yeah. Floyd Floyd took the children, and when she got she got when she got out. She came home to an empty house. So she went to the police and they, um, they told her that since she was legally married to Floyd, it was a civil matter that she would take care of, that she would have to take care of herself. And she had to, she, she went nuts and she actually had to be escorted out of the police station. Yeah. And even, even Dick Darwin thinks that's fucked up. (laughs) Yeah. Right. (laughs) Yeah, dude, that is, oh man. So, so Floyd had taken Allison and Amy and like the baby off at an orphanage and taken Suzanne with him. Suzanne had reached out for help and was ignored, but not every, not everybody feels sympathy for her. Um, the manager yeah. of the, the, the manager of the Moss Venus, um, she was abducted as a kid and was gone for five fucking years. And wow. her mom was beaten down the doors of law enforcement. She even took it to the mayor. She was doing TV interviews. She even went to the state Senate and her, and her perseverance paid off because, uh, you know, because she was found. All mm-hmm. Sand, all Sandra did was sulk and, um, feel sorry for herself. You know, and I, yeah, that's that, that part about, you know, about that manager's mother just, just beating down the doors and everything and not letting it go away reminded me of something else, obviously. Um, mm-hmm. you know, Katrina. So I asked her, yeah. I'm like, what, what do you think? Because she knew about the case. Like, what do you, um, what do you think? I mean, sympathy for Sandra or fuck off Sandra. And basically, you know, she, she was indifferent. She didn't give a shit. She just, you know, she, she was just like kind of whatever, you know, so right. she does, you know, she doesn't feel any, any sympathy for, um, Sandra either. So I was, I was, I was just curious to wonder what, you know, was what she thought. Yeah. About that. <clears throat> so, um, the attorney who Floyd and Suzanne used to adopt Megan, even um reached out to Sandra and she found her like in just okay <laughs> so um 
So Matt Birkbeck decided to have a new headstone made for for Suzanne because it 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 only and the the dancers that she worked with had a headstone put together that just said Tanya on it. Mm-hmm. So so Matt Birkbeck um, decided to have a new headstone made, and he collaborated with Megan on what the new one would say. <clears throat> um. On June 3rd of 2017, the new headstone was put into place. It reads, Savakas, Suzanne Marie, September 6th, 1969 through April 30th, 1990, devoted mother and friend. And it has her picture on it as well. You know, like one of the last pictures that was taken of her. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> Megan, of course, was there for the dedication. And Megan was also pregnant. So Suzanne's grandkid was there too. <laughs> oh, wow. The baby was a boy and Megan named him Michael after her brother. High school friends were there. Cool. Matt Birkbeck and Joe Fitzpatrick were there. Her father Cliff was there. Even some of the dancer friends that she had in Tulsa and Tampa were there. <laughs> so that's, that's how much awesome. been, Yeah. Suzanne could now rest in peace. Yeah, one person who wasn't there, as far as I could tell, was Sandra. Yeah. So, Megan and Cliff have become close. Um, Matt Birkbeck released Finding Sharon, which is a follow-up, letting everybody know that the story had finished. Franklin Floyd died on January 23rd of, of this year, 2023, at the age of 79 on death row in Stark. I guess I can go out there and piss on his grave. Yeah. Yeah, we definitely won't be doing shots on his grave. <laughs> no. <laughs> so, um, I mean, th- this one was rough, and it hit me on a personal level for several different reasons. I, I, I really wish that he had been executed, and I wish that he had chosen old Sparky, because you know you can request the electric chair. Yeah. Old Sparky. You know, Sparky. He's. I think we said on another episode. He's just sitting there waiting. Somebody's going to choose. Sitting there waiting. Yeah, he's sitting there waiting. But I wish something had gone wrong with the chair, causing him excruciating pain. And and I'm I'm just going to (laughs) stop. Yeah. But seriously, I went into this episode blind, and I I think I remember hearing about the trailer explosion, but I'm not sure. But this one was rough with me on a personal level, and I couldn't find any information on whether uh, whether or not he was penned for Suzanne's murder. But we all know he did it. He, yeah. he, took, he took out an insurance policy on her, and she was dead shortly later. Come on. Yeah. But That's way too obvious. <laughs> yeah. But as far as we know, there's... Suzanne, there's Michael, and there's Cheryl. That's three. That makes him a serial killer. Yep. And there's pro- I'm sure there's more. I'm sure there's more. I'm sure. Yeah. So fuck this guy. And um, fuck him in the ear. Yeah. But I am. I. <laughs> this is, this was a, yeah. this was a new experience for me. I was like, as I was going through it, because like I said, I went I went into it blind. <laughs> and <All right. laughs> anyway, that's all I got. All right. So I don't know what the next episode is going to be. No clue. In fact, this <laughs> this one will come out like close to a month after we recorded it. <laughs> but it's good to be ahead. Yes, that's good to be ahead. So anyway, until next week, later. Cheers, everybody.